Okay, so this lecture is chapter 28, the invertebrates. Something that students are often surprised about is the fact that nearly 97% of animal species are invertebrates, meaning don't have a backbone, including the sea star, formerly known as starfish. But when you go to the city zoo, most of the animals are vertebrates. And when you go to the city aquarium, most of the animals are vertebrates. And it gives students, it gives everybody an incorrect impression that most animals have a backbone. But in fact, they don't. So in this picture, we have uh, uh, the sponges. Sponges are members of phylum periphera. There are groups called the calcarea, which have a calcium carbonate uh, structure, exoskeleton skeleton structure. There are silica exoskeletons among the sponges. There are sponges that have spongin and collagen in their exoskeleton, which are much more flexible. But the sponges are a pretty diverse group, um, and they are the simplest. They are the most primitive of the invertebrates, of all the animals, actually. They do not, as a group, have a body symmetry that is consistent. So we say that the periphera are asymmetrical. When they are larva, meaning after egg and sperm fuse, it grows into a small little larva and it swims, but the adults are what we call sessile, which means they attach to a surface and then they stay in one place. They only have what's called intracellular digestion, which you may recall is when a single cell takes in by endocytosis a food vacuole and that food vacuole then fuses with a lysosome and the lysosome contains hydrolytic enzymes for the breakdown of the macromolecules in that food vacuole and that that releases the monomer units into the cytosol for the cell to use in later groups we will talk about extracellular digestion, which is more common among the animal kingdom. Like many animals, they have sexual reproduction, meaning some sponges make eggs, some sponges make sperm. They also have asexual reproduction. In sponge, that means that if a fragment of a sponge for some reason breaks off of a larger sponge, it can land somewhere else and attach and grow and become its own sponge. Sponges are unusual in the sense that they don't have true tissues because the embryo never goes, never becomes a blastula and never becomes a gastrula. And remember the gastrulation is the event that defines the first two germ layers, the first two uh, true tissues. So the sponges do not have true tissues. So we call this the phylum periphera, we call them the parazoa. They are the only group that are in the parazoa. They do not have true tissues, they do not have symmetry. Para means next to or along the side of, and a parazoan is sort of not a mainstream animal. They're in the animal kingdom, but they're not considered the main lineage of the animal kingdom. Now, there are 7,000 species of sponges. And remember, there's only about 4,000 species of mammals. So there are more sponge species than mammal species. And most of them are marine species, meaning they live in salt water. 
Only about 150 species live in freshwater. All of them are aquatic. They all get their food from filtering the water for food particles. They have lots of different shapes shown here in A, B, and C. You can see different colors and shapes of sponges and they have different sizes. So there is a video I will link in um, to the module that you can see here, this link. It's the same link we looked at in lecture, excuse me, in lab. And it shows how the water moves through the sponge in the ocean. And I've highlighted here some of the cell types and some of the other vocabulary that you need to know regarding the sponge. Now the Eumetazoa, that's the other branch of the animal kingdom. And that's everything other than the parazoans, other than the sponges. These animals have true tissues because these animals have embryos that undergo gastrulation. The inner layer after gastrulation is called the endoderm. That will eventually form what's called the gastrodermis, which is fundamentally the digestive system. The ectoderm forms the epidermis, the outer layer, the skin, and the nervous system, the neurons and brain, if there is a brain in the animal. And then there's a layer in between in some, most animals called the mesoderm. And I put muscles, bone, and blood as the fundamental products of the mesoderm development. So the eumetazoans have true body symmetry and they have either two or three of these tissue layers. The two types of body symmetry are called radial or bilateral. The first phylum in the eumetazoa are the cnidarians. The C is silent in this phylum name. So cnidarians live in the ocean mostly, marine. That means ocean water, salt water. They are diploblastic as a rule. And if they are diploblastic, that means they only have two tissue layers that form in the embryo, so only endoderm and ectoderm. And they are radially symmetric. You'll recall that's like a wheel or a pizza. So you can cut through the center of it in virtually any direction, and you can see two mirror image halves. They have neurons, but no brain. They have a nerve net, meaning the neurons crisscross the body, but there's no one place where there are a lot of neurons concentrated into one structure. So their response to touch and gravity and light is very reflex response type. This group has extracellular digestion, and that occurs in the gastrovascular cavity, which is lined by the endoderm in the embryo and then eventually that develops into the gastrovascular cavity. And the individual cells will take in the nutrients that, occur, that are released from the extracellular digestion. So what happens in extracellular digestion is the lining of the digestive organ secretes hydrolytic enzymes into an empty space, which is called the digestive cavity. And then the macromolecules that are in that digestive space are broken down into their monomers. And then the individual cells can bring those monomers in to the cell. What's interesting about the cnidarians is they have no anus. So the food comes in the mouth and the waste, anything that cannot be broken down by those hydrolytic enzymes, will leave the gastrovascular cavity back through the mouth. And you have some examples of cnidarians shown here in these pictures. The one that I want to bring your attention to would be the hydra, which you saw in the lab module. The hydra is a polyp, 
meaning it attaches at the base, and then the mouth is in the center of all these tentacles. The cnidarians have cnidocytes, which contain an organelle called nematocysts, and those contain a kind of a dart or a harpoon structure that is spring-loaded and also has venom, usually a neuro neurotoxin. So this picture shows the medusa form of the body and the polyp form of the body. If there's a polyp form of the body, that means the base here would attach to a surface like a rock in the ocean, and the mouth faces upwards and the tentacles ring around the mouth. The tentacles are where the cnidocytes are located. The medusa is not attached and the mouth faces downward. In either case, the blue line here shows where the gastrovascular or digestive cavity is found. And food goes into the mouth. The cells surrounding the gastrovascular cavity secrete the enzymes into that space. And then the digested, the products of digestion, I should say, are absorbed back into the cells of the body. Anything that cannot be digested has to come back out through the mouth. In between the endoderm and ectoderm, there's a layer called mesoglea. And mesoglea, it has a jelly-like consistency. It's a, it has a certain amount of carbohydrate in it. And so that's where the term jelly comes from. So mesoglea is the scientific term for jelly. Now, it's not a jelly that you would want to eat on toast but it is a type of sticky carbohydrate substance, and that's where it got its name, jelly. So this is a close-up of a cnidocyte, which is the cell. So the cell is the larger structure. Within the cell, the most prominent organelle is the nematocyst. So C-Y-T-E means cell. C-Y-S-T does not mean cell. So it's very close, but there's a, a distinction. Nidocytes are the cells. They contain organelles called nematocysts. The nematocyst has a trigger. It's touch sensitive. So anything that touches the cell will touch the trigger and cause this harpoon-like structure to shoot out. There's typically some venom or toxin on that and it goes, it's shot into the body of the organism that touches it. So these cnidocytes are all over the tentacles of the cnidarians. The sea anemone, it has a polyp body style. You can see how it attaches at the bottom. It has a mouth in the center. Anything that touches the tentacles will trigger the nerve net to contract virtually all the tentacles and move things towards the mouth. Presumably it's because the, the organism is hoping that there is some animal caught on the tentacle, something that's been shot by cnidocytes and is now caught on the tentacles and then it moves the tentacles towards the mouth so it can push it into the gastrovascular cavity for digestion. The sea jelly, formerly known as jellyfish, has a medusa body plan, which means that it faces, I guess the mouth faces downward, so to speak. The food would go into the gastrovascular cavity. Again, secretion of enzymes into that space would result in breakdown of that food. And then anything that cannot be broken down goes back out the mouth. Most of the time, the danger that a cnidocyte poses, excuse me, the danger that a cnidarian poses to um, another animal has to do with the size. So if a huge cnidarian attacks, not really attacks, but shoots toxins into a smaller prey animal, then because of the amount of the toxin, it would probably kill the animal because most of the toxins are neurotoxins. 
but it does have to depend on the dosage that's delivered into the prey. So if you get stung by a jellyfish, if it's a small jellyfish, it's just going to be an irritation. But if you get stung by a huge man of war, which has tentacles that are 10 or 100 feet long, then you could die because of the, the amount of neurotoxin that's being delivered. So it, if the predator is larger than the prey, it's pretty likely that the prey will die. But there are some really tiny sea jellies called um, cubozoans, and they have toxins which are extremely poisonous. So even though they're very small, you can see here in picture A how small they are. There's one in there in that jar. They are very toxic. They do not, at this point, appear off of the coast of the United States but the way that global warming is causing animals to migrate um, that may or may not hold true in the future. All right, I'm going to take a break here and continue with this lecture in the next segment.